So as I was thinking about um, what it means to be truly interconnected with everything that happened this week in the Poor People's Campaign, and this is also Pride Month and Monday, today's Sunday, tomorrow's Monday, is Juneteenth. I think the Juneteenth, yeah, Juneteenth is tomorrow. Um, I've been thinking about how really interconnected we are. And I, I'd like to just start with a few readings from different faith traditions demonstrating that interconnected nature. So um, this comes from John Muir, who uh, lived from 1838 to 1914, and he was the founder of the Sierra Club. And he wrote, when we contemplate the whole globe as one great dewdrop, striped and dotted with continents and islands, flying through space with other stars, all singing and shining together as one, the whole universe appears as an infinite storm of beauty. From the Native American tradition, we have, this is Chief Seattle in 1854. Humankind has not woven the web of life, but we are one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. And from Buddhism, we have, we're all human beings who, through some mystic bond, were born to share the same limited lifespan on this planet, a small green oasis in the vast universe. Why do we quarrel and victimize one another? If we could all keep the image of the vast heavens in mind, I believe that it would go a long way toward resolving conflicts and disputes. If our eyes are fixed on eternity, we come to realize that the conflicts of our little egos are really sad and unimportant. And then we have from Christianity, First Corinthians. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving the greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And so today I also want to share a little story that um, I've shared as a time for all ages in the past, it's been a few years, but times for all ages work for people of all ages. So 
This is called um, Nature's Story. A mouse looked through a crack in the wall to see the farmer and his wife open a package. What food might it contain? What delicacy? The mouse was devastated to learn that it was a mouse trap. Retreating to the farmyard, he proclaimed the warning. There is a mouse trap in the house. There is a mouse trap in the house. The chicken clucked and scratched and raised her head and said, oh, Mr. Mouse, I can tell you this is a grave concern to you, but it is of no consequence to me. I cannot be bothered by it. The mouse turned to the pig and said, there is a mouse trap in the house, a mouse trap in the house. The pig sympathized, but said, I am so very sorry, Mr. Mouse, but there is nothing I can do about it, but pray, be assured you are in my prayers. The mouse turned to the cow and said, there is a mouse trap in the house. There is a mouse trap in the house. The cow said, wow. Mr. Mouse, I am sorry for you, but it's no skin off my nose. So the mouse returned to the house, head down and dejected to face the farmer's mouse trap alone. That very night, a sound was heard throughout the house, the sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed to see what was caught in the darkness, she did not see it was a venomous snake whose tail, had, whose tail the trap had caught. The snake bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital and she returned home with a fever. Everyone knows you treat a fever with fresh chicken soup. So the farmer took his hatchet to the farmyard to the butcher to butcher the chicken. But the wife's sickness continued, so friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock to feed them. To feed them, the farmer took his gun to the farmyard and butchered the pig. The farmer's wife did not get well. She died. So many people came to her funeral that the farmer had the cow slaughtered to provide enough meat to feed them all. The mouse looked upon it all from his crack in the wall with great sadness. We are all connected, he thought. What befalls one of us affects all of us. And like I said, I, I shared this story for the first time probably five years or so ago. I believe it was before COVID. So that, that's how I kind of gauge things these days is pre or post COVID. But I came across it again last night as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, because there is wisdom in this story five years ago, and there's wisdom in this story today. And I was thinking, how have things changed or has the wisdom or has the meaning changed in the last five years? And the answer is no, because when something has wisdom to it, wisdom stands the test of time and principles, if they're true principles, also stand the test of time and the principle of our interconnected web means that we're interconnected always. We don't always understand the interconnections. We don't always acknowledge the interconnection but we're interconnected. And so I've been thinking about this week. It's been such an interesting week for me um, because on Wednesday, I was invited to be part of a mind mapping conversation through the Mesa County Health Department who was looking at the different levels of um, care there is in regards to mental health in Mesa County. And they, um, they had this triangle with community organizations at the bottom of the pyramid. And then I believe it was health organizations. And then it was crisis care. And then it was acute care. 
and they are um, interviewing and talking with people who represent all those different levels of the pyramid to figure out where the care is happening and who's offering it and how it's being offered. And so I felt really honored that they felt like this little Unitarian Universalist congregation is enough part of this community that we needed to be involved in this mind mapping process. And so it was really interesting because I was, I was really glad to be invited because I started writing down a list of just the community connections I had had in the last 24 hours before noon on Wednesday. So between nine o'clock on Tuesday morning and noon on Wednesday, I got a, an email from a UU minister in California saying there is a busload of 28 people coming through and they need lunches for the Poor People's Campaign. I got a call from a young woman who I hadn't seen for about three years from the community saying, um, I think I need somebody to talk to, but because I don't actually have an active plan right now to harm myself, nobody is helping me. I had a woman who came in and just needed the dignity care of help with some head lice. And when I said I would run to Walmart and get her a lice kit within five minutes, I had another woman saying, can you get me one too? During that, I had a 78 year old woman come in with her sweet little dog who has social security, but she's not making enough money to find a place to live in Grand Junction and she's sleeping on the ground. She's 78 and she has this little dog and she has no place to be. And so she sat in this sanctuary with us on Wednesday while this wonderful group of women from this congregation was putting together the yard cell. And she was just sitting right back there in the kitchen. I got her some coffee, trying to figure out what she was needing to do. And then I had a phone call from my wonderful friend who once a month comes in and, and just needs $20. And at first he used to always come up with a, with a story about somebody in his life who had died. Um, and needed $20. Some of you may have met him a few times and, and um, dealt with the, the death of his loved one. And then one day I just said, you know, if you just need some money, just ask for money. And now he just asks for money. Um, but that's about once a, once a month when his paycheck just hasn't come in. And then in the, in the middle of that, there was this wonderful woman who when I said we need help putting together 28 lunches, she had been here helping with mutual aid and she was filled with joy, joy at the opportunity to be asked to help give back to somebody because she has just gotten herself clean and sober and she is just filled with this joy of a new life. And she looked at me and she said, gosh, I just wonder what I could have done with my other 58 years if I had figured this out then. And what I said to her was I said, your 58 years led you to this moment right here. Bar. And then I showed her this quilt right over here, this beautiful quilt that some of our members put together many years ago. And if you look at a beautiful quilt or a beautiful tapestry, you see the beauty and the design and the artistry. But if you look at the back of a tapestry, what you see are a whole bunch of discordant threads and they don't seem like they make any sense. And some of them are long, some of them are short, some of them are intersecting, they clash. 
And you can look at the back of a tapestry and you can think this is a complete mess. And then you turn the tapestry around and you have a beautiful work of art. And that is what I have been thinking about this week, that in that 24 hours between Tuesday at noon and Wednesday at noon, in this sanctuary right here, this little space, we had all of those people here at the same time living out their own storylines, their own threads, their own tapestries. And yet here we are, each one of these threads interconnecting with each other. And in that space was laughter and friendship and joy at being together, you know, the, the yard cell team, it was just so wonderful to have so many of our congregants here working together to offer this yard cell to the community in a way that we've been doing for years and years and years and years. And it was familiar and it was wonderful. And it made my heart joyful to see it. And within the joy and the laughter and the preparation for that, there was fear and there was pain. And what is going to happen to this little old lady and her little dog? And in the middle of that, there was despair with this other person saying, I don't know if I have the resources in this valley. I don't know if I want to continue here. And so what I talked about with her is there are, if you think of life as a wheel, wheels don't turn unless we have spokes. You have to have a number of different spokes. And so how many spokes do you have in your life? Maybe Mind Springs is a spoke and maybe your therapist is a spoke and maybe we're a spoke and maybe your family is a spoke or not. Maybe there are friends, but where are the spokes in your life? So I was talking to her about that. And then Elizabeth showed up with the sandwich stuff and we set up the table and we started making sandwiches and burritos. And I made Danny and her friend Hannah come and help. And so then you had these two teenagers with, you know, Hannah wanted to be here. Danny, my daughter, for those of you who haven't met her, was here because, and she was rolling her eyes. Hannah was having fun. And so you have the tapestry and the life story of these young teenagers that are trying to figure out who they are in relation to all of that. And so in the midst, in the midst of all of this, I went to the Mesa County Health Department to talk about the mind mapping. And they had this triangle, and I can't totally remember it, um, but at the top of the triangle, it was literally like helping people with their physical needs. And then over here, it was, you know, um, working with people with resources. And then over here, it was like internal stuff. And, and what the health department wanted to know was where on the triangle we found ourselves. And what I asked, I realized after I left, I think I was that, that person that, you know, kind of kept just always talking. And because that was, I had just come out of this chaos that was this beautiful sanctuary and they're wondering what we do. And so I said, so do you want us to answer based on what we're designed to do and what we're supposed to be doing? Or do you want us to answer based on what we are doing? I said, because those are not the same things. Because when I think of what this beautiful little UU church is sup supposed to be, or 
me as a minister, what is it that I want to be doing? I want to be talking with all of you about, and this sounds kind of silly, but I want to be talking to you about death and dying and what it means to like be looking at our lives from the perspective of do we have eternal life? Are we reincarnated? Are we, are we spiritual beings? What does that mean? And how does our spirituality impact who we are and how we're living our lives? And that's what I stand up here and talk to you about on Sundays. And that's over here with this kind of internal thing. But then there's over here with the external and there's the community resources and there's the community garden and there's Grand Junction Mutual Aid and there's all of that. And then there's the help that is needed and literally going and buying life kits for people. And Jimmy on a daily basis is helping people figure out where they can safely camp. And they literally need food or they literally need toothbrushes. And so what I ended up doing, you know, she said, well, maybe so what you should do is just put your little sticky note where you are doing what, where you're doing it. And then you can like take a marker and put it where you're supposed to be doing. And so what I ended up doing was taking our little sticky note that said, you, you, and I stuck it right in the middle of that triangle. And then what I did was I took a marker and I drew a marker up to this top of the triangle and I drew a marker to over here and I drew a marker to over here. Because what I realized is that we are right in the center of it all. And I don't think probably, I don't know what other churches and faith communities and organizations are doing, but I think we're probably right now not the only ones. Um, but it, it was interesting. And so as I've been thinking about this interconnected web today, I haven't really known what to say because I don't have it all figured out. But I do think, and what I'm going to spend some time reflecting on is that one moment in time, on Tuesday, when all of these tapestries and all of these threads and all of these life stories were intermersed at the same time in the same place, there was something holy about that. There was something I think fairly profound about that. I don't know what it means. A lot of these tapestries, the life stories, they'll continue on. We may never see some of these people again. They may become members of this congregation. I don't know. But when we look at the wisdom from the traditions, for thousands of years, and they talk about the interconnected web and those threads. That is not wisdom that stopped in the year 2016 or 2020 or 2022 or 1985. Those are threads that continue on and we're part of it. We're part of it individually as human beings. We're part of it collectively as this little faith community. We're part of it as members of Grand Junction and of the United States and of the world. And it goes on and on and on and on. And I was happy to see that the health department is trying. I don't know that they can necessarily give us the answers because I don't know that there are answers, but it was good for me to be reminded that even though we can't do everything, we're doing a lot and we are, at least we're catching some people. 
And the other thing, the other thing that was interesting, and it, I was happy to hear them acknowledge. So I, I said, you know, their, their first pyramid was community organizations and then healthcare organizations and then crisis care and acute care. And what they admitted is that the community organizations, the people, those of us sitting around that table on Wednesday are the ones who are holding the nets right now and are doing the catching because there isn't crisis care in this valley and there isn't acute care in this valley to the extent that it is needed. We have wonderful doctors and clinicians and therapists and psychiatrists, but we don't have enough and we don't have the systems and the programs. And I was wondering why it feels like we're catching everybody. Um, and they admitted it's because we don't have the infrastructure we need here in this valley. And I don't have the answer to that, but I was happy to know that it's being looked at, it's being addressed. And um, I left feeling very grateful for this little space, for all of you, for all of our community connections. And for those of us who come into this space who aren't here on Sunday mornings, but are a part of who we are. And so I guess I'll just leave that here today for us to reflect on how are we interconnected? What is the thread and the tapestry of each one of our lives? How are we contributing? And what does that mean? And um, I just always invite us to then leave leave that, that question open for the larger mystery of what does that really mean? And is there something, is there something larger and cosmic and beautiful happening at the same time, even when it feels like we're kind of in a mess? I don't have any threads to like neatly tie in bows for you today but at least hopefully I've given you something to think about. And so as I was thinking about what I wanted to close with, I just, Paul Tierlink, who came in to this little sanctuary about four years ago with his guitar, he was really nervous and he said, can I just sing you a song? And he's become a friend and um, he was here a lot before COVID. So I want to close today with the song that he sang for me as his introduction to me. No Soul Sings Alone by our friend Paul. So I posted these lyrics on Facebook and people said they wanted to hear it. So here we are. No soul sings alone. There's turquoise sparkling in the summer sky And emeralds dancing in the kitten's eyes I know stardust lays on the moon Each cloud and night A diamond in your heart is shining now Oh, so bright and no oh, soul shines alone. No heart beats on its own. There's a spark of life with this that connects us to the whole. And a song of joy we're singing as we realize God's our real home. Cherries ripe for picking by someone. I hear hummingbird wings beat a rhythm alone. Wildflowers are singing, we are here for everyone. And no soul sings alone. No heart beats on its own. There's a spark of life within us. 
that can make us a song and a song of joy we're singing and we realize love's a real home. No one sings alone. The rivers kiss the mountains and the meadows feed the birds. And your laughter, I am certain, is the sweetest sound I've ever heard. Hear the gentle breeze blowing through your hair. Hear the smell of summer rain fills up the air. I love days we dance in the rain and laugh with no care. When I look into my heart, you're always dancing there. Alone.